um, with ACS editors. So I'm going to invite um, our, panel, our, our panel to the front. Uh, moderating the panel today will be Dr. Dinesh Suarez. Dinesh is the Managing Director for ACS Omega, one of our two open access journals. Um, he's part of the American Chemical Society um, international team based in, in Oxford. Um, and as an ACS first editorial development representative based in Europe, Dinesh is also engaged in editorial outreach for the full ACS publications portfolio. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll just, uh, sorry. Yeah. So thanks very much, uh, Monica. We're delighted to, uh, to be here. Uh, I just wanted to ask our eminent uh, panelists to come up uh, onto the platform so they can engage in dialogue with all of you today. So we have Caroline, from, uh, who's a topic editor from Crystal Growth and Design. Julian, who's an associate editor from Chemistry of Materials. Raba, who's associate uh, editor of uh, ACS AMI, and Sebastian, who's associate editor of Biomacromolecules. I think I'll, I'll leave this with one of you. Uh, I'm, I'm loud, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, the top 10 uh, tips for uh, submission in preparing a manuscript, and uh, I'll hand it over uh, how this is gonna work. I'm gonna essentially read through the tips that uh, they draw up our editors and ACS journals, and then hand over for dialogue Of course, I fully agree with that. And, and, and in, in generally, in my lab, what we do is uh, we start by, uh, and what I do is I start by making the figures. And I think the figures is, is like a, the outline of schemes of, uh, of, the, of, the whole, uh, of the whole paper. And then, of course, before that, and it's, it's what's really at, uh, at the end here, you have to think about uh, uh, what your research or how your research or your experiments can be transferred in a paper quite early, at, at a quite early stage. Uh, meaning that uh, don't do experiment, experiment, experiment without thinking what you're going to do with these experiments. Uh, so drawing figures is uh, is a key step in uh, in my lab. Yes, uh, I can add, add to this uh, why you're doing this research. Ask this question. You, know, you have to have a motivation behind the study, and this needs to translate well into your manuscript when you prepare it for submission. If you don't describe your motivation well enough, editors will maybe take a different view of your submission. So it's, I can yeah. see that in our journal of ACS Omega, where our scientific editors really shoot down papers just because the motivation is not made clear. So this is one of the things you really should bear in mind uh, with your manuscript uh, preparation. Excellent. So um, tip number two, choose the journal carefully. So this is absolutely vital when you're preparing a manuscript. ACS has over 50 journals now. The first one, as you may know, is the Journal of uh, of the American Chemical Society of Jacks, as you probably know, it was founded in 1879. And as the chemical sciences have, has advanced, we have now over 50 different journals. Each of them represent a field or a subfield. So, so for example, we have 10 journals in the ACS portfolio itself, which cover the material sciences. It, it all comes down to the question and the audience you want to address. You should always aim to write your paper based upon who you want to be. 
for the region has to keep the audience in mind and don't necessarily go for the impact factor, which is really becoming more and more trendy, but it's not the way to disseminate your information. So uh, in terms of journal scope, I'll, I'll just hand over to each of our uh, panelists here to tell me a little bit about your specific uh, journal scope. So maybe we start with Delvin. Thank you. So for co crystal growth and design, I think um, I'm especially uh, sensitive to the aspect of crystal structure, as you may have felt during my talk this morning. So everything dealing with uh, crystal structure, polymorphism, nucleation, synthesis, engineering, meaning the relationship between crystal structure and further properties by rational design or uh, screening, uh, synthetic screening is valuable, including theoretical work. So we have a modeling of nucleation processes as well, or electronic structure calculations that derive from understanding of the crystal structure. So the core of the, the issue is to know what are you going to do with crystal structure? It's not acta -cris. You have to have more than a crystal structure, but it has to start with crystal structure understanding. So I think this is an ideal journal dealing with rationalizing crystal structures, nucleation, polymorphisms, and so forth, including modeling. So please think of that as you need. Yeah, uh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, ICS Applied Materials and Interfaces, as you see, the first word is applied. It means it doesn't mean that you make a new material, you send it to ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. Really the important is it's the application. It means if somebody does make or synthesize a new material, does only the characterizations, it's not enough. Have novelty on the material, but if you don't have the application, it will not fit within the scope of the journal. And indeed, sometimes when it happens to me, probably I reject too many papers, but that I had a colleague saying, well, I made a new material, and I did cell viability, and that's an application. Is that cell viability an application? I told him, no, for me it's a characterization. It's part of the characterization. So sometimes, indeed, it depends where people put the application. But without an application, definitely ACS Applied Materials and Interface will not accept any paper, whether it's novel or not, on the material aspect. So we have two sister journals since 2017. So we have Applied Nanomaterials and ACS Applied Energy Materials. So indeed, there then it's a different, two different journals. One is mostly focused on only applied, but has to be nano, while ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces, you can work with bulk materials. It doesn't have to be nano structured material. And the second sister journal, it's ACS Applied Energy Materials, is mostly focused on energy, really at a very, I would say, wide sense in terms of energy-related applications. Yeah, so for chemistry materials, the scope is within the title. It has to be an innovation regarding the chemistry of materials. I mean, quite often we receive some submissions where people mix things and just throw this on cells and investigate what happens to cells, but the materials is re poorly characterized and not really novel. So it has to be an innovation regarding uh, the chemistry. Uh, if the chemistry is not novel or if the material is not novel, it doesn't enter into the, the, the scope. So this is the, the, the main point. And, and I discuss with this quite often with the editor in chief, Jean Burak. And quite often she, she, she tells me, OK, on this paper, the material is not really characterized. Uh, it just mix things and throw on cells. It's not for us. So this is important. Uh, yeah, I'm coming to biomacromolecules. So the, um, the scope is uh, everything that is in between macromolecular science and bio, but uh, bio in a very broad sense, again. Uh, it can be uh, biology and, of course, biological application, but uh, it's not exclusively that. And, and I think some people, there is some misunderstanding about that uh, in the sense that uh, everything that is also uh, polymer science uh, or any kind of macromolecules that is biomimetic, bio-inspired, um, uh, is also in the scope of the journal. So we, we also like very much polymer chemistry and polymer design, not necessarily for bio. Um, and again, macromolecule is a very general word. It can be polymers, but it can be anything, uh, anything else, like proteins, DNA, peptide, which are also macromolecules, basically. Thank you. 
and polysaccharides, of course, all, all micromolecules. Um, and maybe if I, if I can add, if you want to know more about the scope of the journal, also it's uh, important to look at, your, at the editors and, and look at what the editors are doing. It will, it will give you also an idea of uh, what, uh, I mean, the field of, uh, of, uh, of interest and competences of the editors, and it will also give you an idea of the scope. Not, not exclusive, but uh, maybe a more precise idea. Yeah, and that's a very important point to catch, catch up on that, is that but when you're publishing, you're submitting a paper, make sure that uh, you actually, if it's, if it's of high quality and broad scope, broad application, sorry, and uh, of significance, you probably uh, submit your papers to JAX or ACS Central Science. If it's very specialized, but also advancing the field with high impact, you go for uh, 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 an expert journal <laughs> like uh, Christopher Rolland Design or other related uh, subject uh, journals. So I just wanted to point out that ACS Omega, here, yeah, since you may or may not be familiar with it, uh, I'm the managing editor of that journal. And by the way, managing editor, I just wanted to point out while I do a lot of the work behind the scenes, I do not make decisions on the manuscripts. This is the responsibility of our experts, our editors, and this is what sets up, sets aside uh, our ACS uh, journals. We have the real experts actually making the decisions, and they do so with great scrutiny and careful consideration. So I just wanted to raise that point again. In terms of ACS Omega, we are multidisciplinary, broad scope, but we are an open access journal. So anyone can read and use your articles. And uh, we've, uh, we've gathered a significant momentum over the last year in 2017. We published over 1,000 articles and uh, we've had uh, close to a million uh, downloads from our papers. So we're really, really, really uh, quite well now. If anyone wants to talk to me about uh, scope or anything else, please come and uh, meet me after, this, uh, after these lectures. So tip number three, read and follow the guidelines. Uh, I just want to ask first, how many of you have uh, published a paper in an ACS journal? Raise your hand. Okay. Very good, yeah, quite, quite a few of you. And uh, how many of you have had a paper rejected in an ACS journal? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Has anyone's paper been rejected because of scope? Okay, well done. Yeah. <laughs> I, I normally get a uh, few hands that are raised at that point. Uh, so, tip number three. This is obvious. Read and follow the guidelines. Sorry. Read and follow the guidelines. You'd be surprised at how many papers get unsubmitted or rejected just because of the most trivial things like not submitting figures to go along with their manuscripts. There are many, many such cases. You'd be really surprised. Don't be careless, read the ethical guidelines, read the author guidelines carefully before uh, uh, submitting your manuscript. Yeah, yeah, that's also delays, actually, the, the submission. Sometimes if something is missing, that would be kept on the queue, and on hold. Sometimes it takes up for a month because you didn't submit the whole actually files or the whole material for the yes. application. Yeah. And this is a bugbear for uh, us in our role as publishers. We do all the work in terms of getting peer review done in a, a certain amount of time, quickly at best for most papers. And then, for example, one file is not submitted and the papers are old after it's been uh, past peer reviews waiting to be accepted, pending that last file. It could be supplementary data or something like that. So it really uh, impacts on our processing time as well. So you know, think about that as well when you're uh, submitting your, your papers to uh, our journals. Tip number four. Do we have any questions here? Please. Yeah. Please. I have one question. Maybe it's uh, not the right one, but my question is: What is the uh, role of the topic editor? Because uh, I'm familiar with associate editor and so on, but topic editor, uh, I'm not sure. Ah. Well, I'm quite new in this. Uh, I was recruited last year and asked to be topic editor. I was uh, wondering what I should do. So my understanding is that, first, I have only a, a number of limited papers per year. Uh, so it's a restricted uh, responsibility in, with respect to editors. Uh, so I've, mm, depending on my willing to have more, I can go to 20, 30 papers a year. Uh, and the other thing is that I'm meant to propose a topic issue on a subject of my 
choice which I'm thinking of. So I'm trying to build a, a special issue, in fact, on on Morse, as you can imagine. But so it's my responsibility to to, to build that up. Maybe one more question: Do all journals have a token editor? No, no, no. no. So, so this is uh, so we have positions at our editor our editorial structures are so based depending on the needs of that journal. So this is a specialized uh, journal which is growth and design. So there's a need for a topics editor, which functions pretty much as an associate editor given the number of uh, papers you receive. Associate editors uh, are uh, employed on the basis of the journal size. The numbers may vary. I can give you, so for ACS AMI, Raba is an associate editor for ACS AMI. It's a massive, <coughs> massive journal. Last year, it received 20,000 submissions. Think about that. We have, to, we have editors. So we have an editor in chief with that particular structure. We have four executive editors. Kind of rotate with the EIC, so that's a new one there, executive editor. So that's almost like the EIC. But then you have almost 30 associate editors. Spanish, different areas. And that's the need of the journal. Apart from the associate editors, we have a number of editorial designers. So it comes down to the journal. So ACS Comeca is unique in the sense we have four co editors in chief. It's so broad our scope that we need the experts to the fields of the chemical sciences. And we have another three associate editors and something like 60 editorial advisory journals. So I hope that answers your question. So tip number four, tell a story. So this is very important. Make sure the paper has a main punchline, main theme and punchline. Avoid data dumping, provide context to prior literature, and cite the original work in the reference section. We have to explain why the problem is important. That comes down to the motivation I was talking about earlier as well. Share experimental details that would allow another person in your field to re-perform the experiments. This is absolutely vital. Analyze the data accurately and objectively. Provide a strong conclusion, describing how your work moves the field forward, but be realistic. Okay? That's very, very important. You need to compose a paper, make sure your sentences are grammatically correct. It should be concise. Uh, I, I don't know if any of our panelists would like to comment on that. Yeah, I, th I think it's just, yeah, the story, the, well, the word goes very well. I mean, for me, it's a message, yeah? You have uh, results, so what the message you want to give to the, you know, to the, the audience? And that's really important. To, uh, for me, that's how I structure my paper. And then also, from that, you have a certain set of data, then it's obvious whether you have to make additional or do additional experiments, or it's enough to tell your story. Because if you lose the story, if you lose the message, then it doesn't, you know. The ideal, when I get the paper, if I read the abstract, I would like to read the whole paper. It's like any book, you know. If already in the abstract, I'm looking for what the heck I'm doing with this paper, what the guy wants to tell me. I don't find the information. I don't find the message, then it's confusing. It takes more time for us to make a decision, but also it doesn't help us to make the right decision because the message is not there. So that's really important. I mean, the message is the story. The paper is a story. You have to tell exactly what you want to do and how does that differentiate from the, what people have done and what, who did the earlier work on that um, field. And that makes the whole story, I think, the flow is really nice. Then it, even for the editor, it makes things easier. Can I add? Uh, personally, what I think always very difficult when deciding, m writing the manuscript, is where do we stop? Where, where do you, which, which, what is the time we stop the experiment or the calculation and decide, yes, it is publishable? It's, if you are able to do that, it's because you make a thorough analysis of the message you want to deliver. If what you have in, in front, in terms of experiment and simulation, is enough, then you can deliver the message. So I think the analysis of the message, prior, uh, in comparison to what has been done before, is essential, really. This analysis you cannot uh, avoid before making decision to write the manuscript. Yes. As I mentioned, 20,000 submissions. How do you, you know, the associate editor has, or EIC has, only limited time to scan through a manuscript and see what's actually ca uh, capturing his interest or her interest. And make sure all these uh, guidelines are followed. 
to actually get through to uh, the step of the peer review. They have to make their judgments quite quickly and not spend too much time time wasted on minor details. Anyone else? Or should I move on? Any questions here? Yeah, please. Just maybe I have a general and naive question, but which part of the submission is more carefully read by the editor? Is it Thank only you. the abstract, as you said? Or? Great question. Uh, I would say all are important, but some are probably more important to catch the editor's eye. It may not be this specific point, but we're coming to that. Right? We've got to cover the editor and abstract and structuring of papers. Thank you. So, please, just one second. Have uh, we have another question. Just, just a comment on the... On the just a comment on what is needed in the paper for to redo or re-perform the experiments. Where do you put the limit on what we put in supplementary information, and what, what, where do you put the limit to what we keep in the main paper? Um, yeah, I think hmm, I don't think there's a rule. Uh, it's up to the author Norman to decide whether you think it's really primary importance, secondary importance. Whatever you put in supplementary information, it's not as important as I think you will discuss in the body of the paper. For example, the characterization, describing the equipments or the characterization technique, you don't have to be in the body of the paper. So I think this is up to the author. Sometimes what we can do indeed, if we see that so many figures, then it's better indeed. If two figures exactly, they don't you know, add much to the discussion, it's better to put the second one on the supplementary information. Because you had the most important information from the figure A. I don't need the B, so I can really read the paper, understand the, the paper just based on A. So B is there probably because you change the temperature, whatever, so it's better to go to supplementary information. I think, honestly, it's better to have a good paper of 10 pages or five pages. If you can put the information, the message is enough to describe in five pages why to put 10 pages. Because you know, today we have, even independent of being an editor, as an author, what you read mainly when you, when you look at literature search. You read the abstract. Then if you're interested, you go to the details inside the paper. So I think if you can make a paper out of five pages and we have the right message, it's enough. If we can make it seven pages, it's enough. But this is the decision of the author. I don't think the, at least I never really went into that detail to ask the author to move figures. Some reviewers do, but not the editors, as, as far as I'm concerned, actually. If I may, for crystal growth on design, it's a bit uh, more focused on crystal structure. So it is absolutely essential that you give all the synthetic uh, conditions precisely to reproduce a synthesis. Of course, if the synthesis is not new, uh, a supplementary will do. But if you have established a new synthetic pathway for getting to a polymorph, for example, this is absolutely essential to be in the paper. And no, of course. So I think it depends on the journal as well, the scope of the journal, and what you want to highlight in your uh, synthesis. Yes, it, it also comes down, I suppose, to word limits imposed by certain mm. journals. So you have to consider that. Um, I can say from ACS Omega's point of view, because our, our, our mandate and our, our, our scope and our, our mission is to uh, have papers of technical rigor, we don't impose any such uh, format limitations in, in terms of word count. For the experimental section, and it's in fact encouraged. So you can have it in the main text as well. So there's no limit uh, in, in, in actually describing your methodologies as long as it makes sure that people get reasonably the Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So, uh, so, anatomy of a manuscript, uh, probably everyone in this room is very familiar with. Uh, manuscripts having a title, an abstract introduction, have some, a, a number of graphics, an experimental section, results and discussion, a conclusion, and of course, references. In, coming, in writing a manuscript, this is not necessarily a, a linear process. Uh, I suppose many of you will start with the experimental section where you describe what work you actually did, while going on then to describe your results and discussion and coming up with a punchy conclusion. Uh, one thing here is the references. Please avoid heavily self-citing yourselves. We have uh, in-house staff who actually look at these kind of things uh, on the advice of uh, our editors and some of our journals. So just bear that in mind. We are looking for people who are just trying to boost their metrics uh, whatever way they can. 
Uh, I don't know if any of our panelists have to say anything about how, how, how would you go about uh, constructing your manuscripts? Uh, Julian, could you say something about uh, would you write the experimental section first? I know it varies by authors. But I, I prepared the figures first, uh, as I, I said, uh, said before. Uh, once I had the figures, I have the story, so I just write on that, and that's it, more or less. Yeah, Victor just keeps a thousand words often said that you mm -hmm. can look at the, uh, what the manuscript is about by just looking at the, uh, the figures. And yeah, and if, if I may just complete, I mean, I fully agree on that. And also, as an editor, what I look at the when I when I have to uh, uh, to look at the papers, I mean, and make the first decision, which is important, uh, is uh, I, I look first at the, f at the figures, and uh, what I read, really read, is not the abstract, is read the introduction, mm -hmm. and, and and I think the introduction is uh, is very important because it uh, it has to be, uh, uh, and it's probably and this is the thing also that I do write uh, the, the, at the latest moment when I when I write a paper. Because I think it's, uh, it's the most important in the sense that uh, you explain what's the field, the point you want to address, and how you will address the, the, the point. So you tell the whole story with the history in that. Uh, and and, and, uh, and I, I, I pay very much attention on that. What about citing references from the journal you are submitting to? Are you? No. I mean, to, to be, this is what I, what I love from ACS. We don't have any kind of a push uh, to uh, artificially grow the citation of the journal. Uh, and it's, maybe it's not good for ACS itself. I know some, some, other, some other editors are doing that, or some other companies are doing that. Not, not ACS, it's purely based on science. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is lovely. Yeah. Uh, I think you're on, on this respect, actually, we never ask the author to cite any paper published by ACS or from the journal he's willing to publish in. We knew absolutely don't have any well, ever ever asked any author. Not to ask, but uh, if you receive a paper with n no citation from your journal, uh, wouldn't you consider maybe it's out of the scope of my journal? I, I don't have a look to the reference that way, never. Actually, no. I mean, of course, at, at some point, if you hesitate uh, and if you say, hmm, is it really in the scope? To be honest, I look at the references. But I don't look at if the paper cite references from the journal. I look if the paper cite references in the field. Uh, uh, and of course, if you submit a paper in a polymer journals and if you cite only inorganic material science or pharmaceutical science papers, there's something wrong, maybe. But maybe it's not a, the, the primary decision. I wanted to add a general comment regarding the importance of the introduction. Uh, with respect to the few papers I have a year, maybe 20, I see huge difference, differences between good papers having thorough introductions and weak introductions. And generally, it goes together with the quality of the discussion. Because if in the discussion you do, don't have any reference from other works, comparisons, and evaluation of your own work towards what have been done before, the discussion is weak. And generally, the introduction is weak, too. So uh, I would uh, really encourage you to nurture your introduction so that your discussion is more thorough and tough. So here's. Uh there are some uh, cases of where imprecise language. You should be aware that what you write you know, may reflect on what the viewer and editor actually reads. So you need to uh, structure your sentences very carefully. Some common language pitfalls, some of it has long been known. I, I did not look up the reference. In my experience, once. In many cases, twice. In a series of cases, three times. It is believed that. I think. It is generally believed that a couple of other people think so too. <laughs> so be careful, always reference uh, your sentences and uh, make sure it's clear and you're specific in what you're trying to do. Anyone has anything to add? Any questions around that? Yeah, but you should always uh, try and, uh, as mentioned earlier, cite the original reference where possible. <coughs> 
So tip number five, draw graphics with care. Be clear and precise, simple but informative. Graphics should complement the text and support your story. Use color. At ACS, we don't charge for color. We have some publishers who still, still do. Graphics must be original, unpublished artwork created by the author. Be careful of issues such as copyright. So this is just an example of a good graphic uh, where things are legible and clear. Make sure you use the correct font size uh, as specified in the author guideline. Any questions around that? Yeah, just yeah. comment on the figures because it's really important. And um, yeah, often people they miss to put the error bars. Yeah, this is really uh, yeah. I I stop when I see a figure without error bars. That's it. I block there. I mean, yeah, I cannot. It's just I think in a, it's unacceptable to publish figures, especially I mean in applied materials and interfaces. At least you have to show that your experiment, your material is performing well. It's reproducible. So yeah, there are a lot of people will show you once a value which is, I don't know, a, I'm not saying exaggerated, but probably it happens once. Yeah, so yeah, error bars are really important in figures. Any questions? <laughs> All right, let's go on uh, to tip number six. Attract readers with a strong title. Craft a compelling title. Describe your findings in as few words as possible. Avoid buzzwords and hard to justify claims like first and only. Some editors take the view of even novel if they're trying to justify what you're doing. It should be apparent. Avoid asking a question in the title. The title should contain your results, not the question. Always uh, make sure that your title is not too long. You don't have to describe every method that was undertaken synthesis, electrochemistry, characterization, etc. And have fanciful uh, claims like attacks DNA and cures cancer. Be spot on in what is it actually achieved. This is a lovely shortened title. So and so complex cleaves DNA at nanomolecular concentration. Bang on. I don't know if anyone has any uh, comments around this, uh, creating a good title. Okay. So, tip number seven. Table of graphics, uh, table of content graphics count. These really count. These are the first things people are attracted to when they see your paper. And it should give a quick visual impression of the essence of your manuscript. Here are four figures from ACS Omega, actually, that I, I thought just summed it up beautifully. Here you have, a, for those of you who are into protein structures, you can't go wrong with protein structures, like advice. But here's a beautiful example, it immediately tells you your cleaving of cutting up uh, an end terminal tag of this protein and getting some uh, output. Over here, copper plus trypsin at certain pH above 7 or below 7, 9, read out. Very easy to follow the actual work just from this one table of content. There you go, bottle of wine. Fantastic, I was immediately drawn to that one. <laughs> Describing some of the compounds uh, for pigmentation in that wine. So, if you can see the power of some of these uh, table of content graphics, I hear from our folk in chemical abstracts that they, they have evidence that those with a better or clearer table of content actually gets higher readership. And those are tracked by our uh, chemical abstract. I have one advice for that. Just make it really simple. Not bulky with tiny details and everything. Just really simple. Yeah, and this is another part where, as I mentioned, the table of contents not being submitted and holding up our processing. Right. These are important now in the age of social media as well. You, you have to have these so that it appears on uh, the front to get a visual impression of what your work is <coughs> about to tweet, for example. So tip number eight, revise, edit, and rework. This is a video, and it's actually a series that's uh, been produced by the American Chemical Society. Which time, sir? Hmm? It's called Publishing Your Research 101. It has 10 episodes, which uh, take you through the process of how to prepare uh, your manuscripts and for submission. This is actually George Whitesides mm -hmm. from Harvard. He's one of the world's great uh, chemists. And uh, he talks about how he works in terms of uh, writing his paper. In this video, he actually describes that he sends it out for uh, Viewing within this group and has it edited at least 15 times before he actually finally submits it. Remarkable. Yeah. So uh, it's very important to revise, edit, and rework. Multiple iterations possible. 
Je ça, je pense à lui. Yeah, that's that's. I think Sonic would be tough for at least for us, at least in France, because yeah, indeed, in uh, the States you have the native language-speaking people, then it's much easier, I guess, for yeah. But people ask for professionals nowadays for editing. Yeah. Yes, and uh, just to go on that point, uh, we've seen a significant rise in published content coming out of China recently, and the language in the manuscripts that it has improved dramatically. Mm -hmm. That's in part uh, because of the use of professional editing mm -hmm. services. That has made a huge difference uh, in China's both as a scientist and as And in fact, just coming on uh, the topic, ACS has uh, an authoring service, a professional authoring service to help with uh, uh, editing your manuscripts should you think that necessary. But also interesting, one of the episodes in this uh, publishing your research 101 series focuses on tips for English as a second language speakers. So I really highly recommend you to actually go and, and, and listen to uh, the comments uh, via editor picture here. We also have an ACS style guide for effective communication of scientific information. Tip number nine, second last one, prepare your supplementary information with care. As I mentioned earlier, this has to be uh, also, it's peer review supplementary information, make sure what's uh, not going to be part of the main text follows into the supplementary information. This is actually uh, an editorial in organic letters where uh, the editors added a staff member fully devoted to the task of looking at supplementary information in 2012 to focus on a more uh, consistent and systematic supplementary information review prior to publication. And they talk about the common uh, problems that they discovered when undertaking this exercise <coughs> from wrong data in the, main, in the supplementary to figures being uh, misannotated, etc. And uh, I don't know if you have any comments on supplementary data information in your specific journals. Nothing there. Any questions on that? Yeah, please. Yeah. An instant, an instant. Yeah, this is really your... Yeah, is there any <laughs> limitation for supplementary information? But sometimes you have just a paper about five pages, but then you have something like 50 pages of supplementary information. Isn't there any limitation also by the journals? By, because sometimes it's like a, a second article. Mm. Yeah. Uh, any comment on that? Uh, I, I can answer that. There's no, there's no limit as far as I know in any ACS journal. Yeah. In fact, organic chemistry papers, you have a synthesis section which is really strong. You know, it, it, and it's absolutely necessary uh, to submit that as well. So it, it, I suppose it's really specific, but as yeah. far as I know, yeah, sometimes, for example, for uh, ACSM, I would have, for the materials, you need to synthesize some organic molecules, and that goes to the supplementary information. It could be quite huge, but yeah, because we deal with materials, we don't deal with molecules, so yeah, that's justified to be in the supplementary information. But there's no limits, whether for the page number, in both actually sections, yeah. Yeah, a couple of letters are really, really important. There is a, a blog 
post from the editor in chief of Nature Chemistry, sorry, uh, and it ex he explains why writing the cover letters is really, really important. So uh, please have a look, and, and uh, it's really important because this is the first impression the editor has uh, fr from the paper. Uh, it should contain um, the, the message, wh why it's so important, how you address this, and, and these kind of things. And if you write the cover letter like, okay, this is my, my articles, thanks, um, no, it's, it doesn't give a really nice impression. So write your cover letters really uh, uh, in, in a good way. Yeah. And I, I, what I like in the cover letter, it gives more than the science, because you can understand the context of the work, the history of it, that you may not have time or space to explain in the scientific paper. So it's, it's the place you can do that and take advantage of it. Okay. Can I follow up? I mean, to be honest, I, I, I disagree with, uh, <laughs> with what has been said, and, and it's also important to, to, to tell it, because uh, we are all different, and we all have different uh, way to evaluate a paper and to judge it, and, 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 and we are all free to do it. So at some point, what, what, uh, what does that mean is that everything is important, uh, because we all look at different things. And I mean, personally, I don't look at the cover letter, I mean, at first. I look first at the paper, the whole math script, the figures, the, the introduction, and then, if I'm not sure, I look at the cover to see how the author explain their work, because maybe I misunderstood something. But it's not a thing I, I read first, to be honest. Maybe it's important for journals such as Nature Chemistry, because they're not necessarily handled by a professional editor, but uh, in general, I know the field, I know the, I know the scope, I know the literature, so I don't need explanation from the authors. But again, uh, this, is not, this is the way I do it, and we all do different. So, so again, at the end, I think every point we talk about are very important. Yeah. And, and these are the top 10 tips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. So if you follow those top 10 tips, then you're pretty much ready for submission and give your chance to actually for the editor send your paper out for review. Make sure you have all these elements. In fact, manuscript, file, cover letters, open information. Make sure your author names and contact information are accurate. It's a common, it's becoming, well, it's not common, but a lot of our corrections and additions in our journals are simply because of wrongly annotated author contact information, and it's not nice for publishers to actually come up with an addition and correction to so then wonder is the data something wrong with the data before they actually see it. It's something quite minor. And please provide uh, information of your preferred reviewers. I don't know if you have any comments on, uh, we're coming to peer review actually, so we, we, we cover that in the next, uh, Sebastian will cover that in the next uh, presentation. So this brings us to the end of uh, this particular uh, panel discussion, but please, uh, should we have time for um, how do you choose uh, the authors? Like, um, uh, is there a limit on of, of the number of authors? No, not at ACS. Certain publishers that do, especially if you have more than 10, then you have to justify the contribution of each. But ACS will never ask for that, no. Any other questions? Thierry. Toujours en français. Quelle est la politique d'open access pour ces journaux d'ACS? What's uh, APC? <laughs> Uh, for open, open access. access. So, yes. good question. Thank you. So, uh, we have two fully open access journals to begin with. Uh, one is ACS Central Science, and that's uh, meant to be a high impact journal. And if your paper is accepted in that journal, there's no APC. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there will be access to a highly limited number of papers in that journal. The second one is my uh, journal where I'm managing editors, ACS Omega, and our APC is $750. So that's uh, well below uh, most of the uh, publishers who charge open access fees. You can look at major communications, for example.
something that's a higher factor, but that's something like that, uh, 4,000 or something like that. So think about that. <laughs> yeah, so we have a reasonable um, open access APC for our journals. In terms of uh, hybrid journals, all our ACS journals uh, allow for open access should you uh, pay the fee. And your author choice smart license will depend on whether you're an ACS member or not and whether your institute subscribes to ACS journals or not. So that can have an uh, Yes, that's right. Uh, so um, if you're an author from an institution that is a subscriber to ACS journals, um, notably all PAPs, the full package, uh, you are entitled to a 25% discount on the APC. At the same time, if you are also an ACS member, you get an additional 50% discount. So that's a great, um, a great opportunity. I don't know that there's a pick up. Should be 4, yeah, that's for non-members and members. Non-members and non-members. Yeah. Non but uh, members. if you're a member, then it's uh, uh, 1,500. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have that exact figure, which I'm very happy to share. Uh, I have it on my laptop. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No? All right, well. Thanks to our panel. Thank you very much to our panel for this interesting discussion. Thank you.